When an archaeological discovery is made, there are two stories to be told. One is the story of whatever's been found, and the other is the story of how it was discovered. Combine those two things and you ought to have some incredible stories to tell. Stories like the ones we have for you in this video. The Teocalli of the Sacred War, also known as El Teocalli de la Guerra Sagrada, is a remarkable pre-Columbian sculpture that resembles a miniature Aztec temple. It was discovered in the foundations of the National Palace of Mexico in 1831, but wasn't removed until the 1920s. Today, it is housed in the Museo Nacional de Antropología in Mexico City. The sculpture depicts various significant elements of Aztec iconography and mythology. It consists of a flat-roofed temple and a truncated pyramid with stairs at the front. The front of the sculpture features a solar disk, with figures of Huitzilopochtli and Tepeyolotl, as well as the earth deity Tlaltecutli and military equipment symbolizing warfare. The sculpture's sides showcase figures representing Tlaloc, Tlahuizcalpantecutli, Xochipili, and Zayhuticutli. The back of the sculpture displays an eagle on a prickly pear cactus, symbolizing Huitzilopochtli and war. The Teocalli's platform features a zoomorphic earth monster. The sculpture is believed to be associated with the ruler Motokuzuma II, as it contains glyphs representing his name. Interpretations of the sculpture's symbolism vary, with some emphasizing its connection to human sacrifice and warfare, while others see it as representing cosmograms and the sacred nature of the Mexica people. Ancient Persian water clocks, known as clepsidras, were intriguing timekeeping devices that used the controlled flow of water to measure time. Dating back to 500 BCE, these clocks were widely used for over a millennium. In Persia, a typical water clock consisted of a bowl placed in a pot of water. As water gradually filled the bowl, it would sink, indicating the passage of time. A designated timekeeper would reset the clock by emptying the bowl and placing it back on the water's surface. Records indicate that the position of timekeeper was a prestigious one, and its holder would have enjoyed elevated social standing. The simple technology was also employed in irrigation systems, ensuring fair water distribution in arid regions like Persia and China. Another form of clepsidra used in ancient Rome features a graduated cylinder with a hole, measuring time by tracking the water level. Water clocks continued to evolve, incorporating gears and wheels, until they were eventually replaced by pendulum clocks in the 17th century. Nevertheless, these ancient Persian water clocks remain remarkable artifacts, showcasing humans' ingenuity and measuring time using the gentle flow of water. The Stela of Akhenaten and his family is an extraordinary ancient Egyptian artifact that offers unique insights into the reign of Pharaoh Akhenaten and his revolutionary religious reforms. Created during the Amarna period, around 1350 BCE, this limestone stela depicts Akhenaten, his wife Nefertiti, and their three daughters in a distinctive artistic style. The stela stands at approximately six feet tall and showcases the royal family in intimate and affectionate poses, reflecting Akhenaten's emphasis on familial love and the worship of the sun disk Aten. The artwork also reveals the pharaoh's physical features, characterized by elongated facial features, a slender body, and exaggerated lips. The inscription accompanying the scene praises the pharaoh and highlights his role as the intermediary between the divine Aten and the people of Egypt. The stela serves as a significant historical document, shedding light on Akhenaten's religious revolution, the prominence of his family, and the artistic style of the Amarna period, making it a vital artifact for understanding ancient Egyptian culture and the reign of one of its most important yet enigmatic pharaohs. The Museum August Kessner in Hanover, Germany, houses a remarkable Minoan sarcophagus, also known as a Larnax, as one of its prominent antiquities. Dating back to the 14th century BCE during the late Minoan 3A period, this Larnax is believed to have originated from the island of Crete. Larnaxes were pottery sarcophagi designed after wood coffins, and were commonly used in late Minoan funerary customs. 
Although too small for complete bodies, they served as ash chests for cremation remains. The Hanover Larnax is largely intact, with some reconstructed parts, while the lid displays two wave bands and a flattened roof-like structure that securely fits on the sarcophagus. The sarcophagus itself exhibits a single brownish paint color on all four sides, a typical feature. The composition is intricate, but the painting technique appears crude compared to earlier Minoan palace paintings. The main side depicts a central tree with dogs chasing goats above them, speared and pierced. One short side portrays two fighting wild goats, while the other short side and the reverse showcase floral motifs. The interior of the sarcophagus is less meticulously worked than the exterior, but functions perfectly well as a container. The image you're about to see comes from a vintage postcard and showcases a pair of remarkable golden gloves or arms from the Chimu culture, a pre-Columbian civilization in Peru. Crafted in gold, these ceremonial artifacts are a testament to the exceptional craftsmanship of the Chimu people. The reverse side of the postcard provides intriguing details about an exhibition at the San Diego Museum of Art, held from August 25th to November 30th, 1980 during which various Chimu artifacts like these were on display to the public. The metalwork depicted in the exhibition portrays warriors adorned with plumed headdresses, breastplates, and short skirts, representing the rich cultural heritage of the Chimu civilization. Residing on the northern coast of Peru, the Chimu were eventually conquered by the Inca Empire several decades prior to the arrival of the Spanish conquistadors. This tiny glimpse into the Chimu culture offers a glimpse into the artistic mastery and historical significance of pre-Columbian civilizations in Peru. Sadly, much of the history and cultural knowledge of these remarkable people was lost when the Spanish invaders tore through their territories. The winged horses of Tarquinia are a remarkable artistic marvel from ancient Etruscan civilizations. These exquisite winged horses, also known as Pegasus, can be found depicted on the walls of tombs in Tarquinia, a city located in present-day Italy. The Etruscans, a sophisticated and enigmatic people who flourished in the region from the 9th to the 1st century BCE, held a deep reverence for these mythical creatures. The winged horses are depicted with graceful bodies, flowing manes, and majestic wings, capturing the imagination and symbolizing power, beauty, and divine connection. These stunning frescoes showcase the artistic skill and mastery of the Etruscans, who excelled in various forms of art. The significance of the winged horses of Tarquinia remains a subject of speculation, with theories ranging from their representation of the afterlife to their association with the divine realm. Today, these ancient artworks provide invaluable insights into the rich mythology and beliefs of the Etruscan civilization, leaving us in awe of their artistic legacy and their fantastic portrayal of these mythical winged creatures. Perhaps we'll understand their meaning better if we one day succeed at fully translating their written language. The Monomachus crown is a fascinating and priceless artifact from the Byzantine Empire. It's a ceremonial crown, believed to have been created in the 11th century during the reign of Constantine IX Monomachus, who gave the crown its name. This intricate piece is made of gold and embellished with precious gems, including pearls, sapphires, emeralds, and garnets. The crown's design features intricate filigree work, delicate enamel, and religious iconography, including symbolic representations of humility and other traits, showcasing the exceptional craftsmanship of Byzantine artisans. The Monomachus crown is a symbol of imperial power and authority, as it was worn by Byzantine emperors during coronation ceremonies. Its opulence and beauty reflect the wealth and artistic sophistication of the Byzantine Empire. Today, the crown is housed in the treasury of the Aachen Cathedral in Germany, where it serves as a testament to the grandeur and cultural legacy of the Byzantine civilization. The Monomachus crown stands as a reminder of the enduring impact of Byzantine art and craftsmanship, amazing those who gaze upon it with its exquisite beauty and historical significance. The Luck of Eden Hall is a beautifully adorned enameled glass beaker 
believed to have been made in Syria or Egypt in the mid-14th century. Decorated with exquisite arabesques in blue, green, red, and white enamel with gilding, it currently resides in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, England. The beaker measures approximately 6.2 inches in height and 4.4 inches in width at the brim. It gained prominence in the 15th century when it was encased in a decorated stiff leather case with a lid featuring the Christian IHS symbol, ensuring its preservation over the centuries. This exceptional beaker is considered an outstanding example of luxury Islamic glass from the 14th century. Its original name is unknown, but it became known as the Luck of Eden Hall when it was mentioned in the will of Sir Philip Musgrave in 1677. The glass's enduring presence within the Musgrave family of Eden Hall, Cumberland, led to its legendary status, believed to bring prosperity to its owners. The glass, unbroken throughout its lineage, was loaned to the Victoria and Albert Museum in 1926 and acquired by the nation in 1958, where it continues to attract visitors in the medieval and renaissance galleries. The invention of the stethoscope happened over 200 years ago. Its origins can be traced back to Dr. René Lanech at the Necker Hospital in Paris in 1816. At that time, the standard practice of listening to the respiratory system involved placing one's ear directly against a patient's chest. However, in a particular case where the patient was overweight, Dr. Lena sought an alternative approach. He rolled a piece of paper into a tube and placed it between his ear and the woman's heart, finding that it amplified the sound. This accidental discovery led to the creation of the stethoscope as we know it today. Dr. Paul Ferdinand Gatchett, who owned an early wooden stethoscope, was an extraordinary physician associated with the renowned artists of the Impressionism movement. Gatchett's unique healing abilities, including his interest in palm reading, attracted Vincent van Gogh, and they lived together in 1890. Unfortunately, Gatchett's care couldn't save Van Gogh. Over time, inventors improved the stethoscope's design, and by the 1850s, the single-tubed stethoscope had evolved into a binaural device. Dr. George Kamen developed the widely available Kamen stethoscope in 1852, featuring two ivory earpieces connected to silver tubes and a conical-shaped piece for placing on the heart. This design closely resembles the modern stethoscope. Templo Mayor has already given us many fantastic ancient artifacts over the years. It was once the heart of a huge religious complex in the Aztec city of Tenochtitlan. What's left of it is now an archaeological site in Mexico City. Experts and archaeologists have been digging through the site for decades and will continue to do so for several decades more. But in June 2022, they confirmed the discovery of more than two and a half thousand wooden objects believed to have been left at the site as religious or ritual offerings. There's no set pattern to the objects. They include figurines, headdresses, masks, jars, earrings, and scepters, all of which were probably deposited by priests during the 14th century as a means of consecrating the Templo Mayor to the gods that the Aztecs believed in. It's rare for wooden objects to survive for so many centuries in such good condition, but in the case of these artifacts, it seemed they were preserved by a combination of the high level of humidity in the region and the anaerobic conditions in the soil. It's not easy to tell what our next artifact is at first glance, but keep looking at it and pay close attention to the markings around its edges. Found inside Denisova Cave in November 2019, this is believed to be a figurine of a lion. And if it is, it's the oldest animal figurine ever discovered. Experts say that it's more than 45,000 years old. The small carved sculpture made from a mammoth tusk appears to show a lion's underbelly, hind legs, and upper torso. For some reason, there aren't any front legs and nor is there a head. Archaeologists aren't sure whether it was designed without a head or whether the head broke away and disappeared thousands of years ago. The multiple lines on the torso of the figure are thought to represent fur, and the piece was polished after it was finished. Whoever made it was presumably very proud of their work. This is yet another remarkable discovery in the Denisovan Caves. 
It seems that the more archaeologists look into the cave, the more evidence of an advanced ancient civilization they find. The Ardabil carpet isn't one carpet, it's two. When most people use the term, though, they're referring to a very large Persian carpet that can now be found in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, England. There's some controversy about this larger version of the carpet, though, as it was reconstructed in the 19th century, and it appears that sections of the smaller carpet were used to help reconstruct the large one. At its current shape and size, the carpet is 34 feet long and 17 feet wide. What's left of the smaller one is currently in the Los Angeles County Museum of Art in the United States of America. The style of both carpets is typical of the Tabriz design, with medallions at their center and ornate designs surrounding the central medallions. It's designed to reflect the appearance of Persian gardens, which are considered symbols of paradise by Muslims. Helpfully, there's a cartouche on the largest of the carpets, which dates it to 1539. That's the earliest verifiable date on any Persian carpet. Despite international campaigns to have either one of the carpets returned home, they both remain in their respective British and American museums. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching, and see you soon.